There's definitely no shortage of musculoskeletal conditions that weight gain predisposes people to. Here are just some examples. But above all, sciatica may be the most troubling to cope with day to day. It's a condition characterized by pain, numbness and pins and needles radiating along the path of the sciatic nerve and its branches. Weakness can also be a consequence. The sciatic nerve originates from the lumbar and sacral plexus at the lower back, specifically from the nerve roots L4 to S3. These nerve roots come together in the lower spine to form the sciatic nerve, which then travels down the posterior aspect of the leg. Sciatica is very tough on people due to how severe the symptoms can get, and since it's frequently not localised to one area, but rather diffuse in nature. One study suggests that overweight persons are at a 12% increased risk of it, and obese at 31%. There are several reasons why this is, such as impaired glucose tolerance, as well as the increased associated load and the pro-inflammatory effects of fat tissue. But another, which we're going to zero in on this video, is the change in biomechanics that happens since it can contribute to nerve entrapments at certain locations. But first, as always, please take note of our disclaimer. What mightn't come as much as a surprise is that the lower back, particularly at the level of the L4 to S1 vertebrae, is one of the most common impingement points for the sciatic nerve within the spinal column. Sciatica can arise from nerve roots being pressed upon by things like a herniated disc, where one of the discs that act as a shock absorber between the vertebrae protrudes out, spinal stenosis, where the spinal canal is narrowed, or spondylolisthesis, where one vertebra slips, so to speak, over the one below it. The L4 and L5 nerves can also get pressed as they exit the intervertebral foramen if the opening isn't big enough. Biomechanically, excess weight can worsen the risk for all of this due to what's known as anterior pelvic tilt, which, as implied by its name, is when the pelvis tilts forward. This is because it makes the natural curve in the lower back become more prominent, and so creates excessive compression of lower back structures. Of course, the main cause of anterior pelvic tilt is muscular imbalances arising from our poor daily postures at work and home. Generally, the hip flexors and lower back muscles get shortened, and the abdominals, gluteal and hamstring muscles weaken. At the same time though, weight gain can also contribute to anterior pelvic tilt since fat builds up disproportionately on the front side of the torso versus the back side, leading the pelvis to respond accordingly. Outside of the spinal column, there are several other potential entrapment sites for the sciatic nerve in the leg that weight gain predisposes people to. For example, apart from the lumbar spine becoming more extended from the pelvis anteriorly rotating, another consequence is that the thigh bones become more inwardly rotated so as to counteract the accompanying shift in the centre of gravity. This adaption can worsen the risk for piriformis syndrome, a condition in which the piriformis muscle squeezes the sciatic nerve. The reason for this is commonly that the piriformis is forced to take up the slack of other muscles in the area not taking their fair load leading the muscle to shorten over time from a lack of support. Further down the leg, we come to a junction known as the popliteal fossa. This hollow at the back of the knee serves as a passageway between the thigh and the lower leg. It contains things like the popliteal artery, vein, and the tibial and common fibular nerves, which are the nerves that the sciatic nerve branches off into just before getting to the fossa at the lower thigh. These nerves don't run under the popliteal muscle in the popliteal fossa, rather superficially to it. Still, shortness in the muscle can indirectly add to nerve compression by causing increased associated pressure or reduced space in the region. And the popliteal muscle can become shortened from the tendency of overweight persons to develop inwardly rotated legs. On a quick side note, if you'd like to undertake our evidence-based and results-backed personalised Plato weight management program, please click the link in the top right-hand corner of the video or follow the link in the description. Following this, we come to the lower leg. Similar to how the upper thigh inwardly rotates to accommodate the change in pelvic position from increased body weight, the lower leg does the same, while the foot compensates for all of this by rolling inward. Combined, these biomechanical changes can lead to tightness in the calf and fibular musculature, 
which can lead to compression of the fibular tunnel, an opening that the common fibular nerve runs through to wrap around the head of the fibular bone. So this is the next potential entrapment site. It's called the common fibular nerve from being made up of two nerves that it splits into the superficial fibular nerve and the deep fibular nerve shortly after transitioning from the sciatic nerve. Where this division happens varies based on the individual, but it's usually around the fibula head. Afterward, the superficial and deep fibular nerves travel down the outside and front compartments of the lower leg in comparison to the tibial nerve, which continues straight down posteriorly to the ankle. Okay, so that's for the entrapment points at the lower back, hip and knee regions. Now for the ankle. Basically, regarding the sciatic nerve branches, there are three areas where they run into the foot. On the inside, on the top, and on the outside. Laterally, it's the sural and the superficial fibular nerves that run into the foot. These can indeed get affected by incorrect foot posture, but much less commonly than the nerves running from the lower leg at the dorsum of the foot and medially. Medially, this concerns the tibial nerve running through the tarsal tunnel referred to when obstructed as tarsal tunnel syndrome, while dorsally it relates to the lesser spoken about anterior tarsal tunnel that the deep fibular nerves run through, known when impeded as anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome. For both entrapment sites, foot overpronation is a common culprit, which again is a biomechanical adaption to an increased BMI. Locally, weaknesses in the tibialis anterior tibialis posterior and the intrinsic foot muscles can contribute to excessive pronation along with tightness in the calves and peroneals. But globally, imbalances from the hip and knee musculature arising from changes in biomechanics can lead to this too. On the other hand, for anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome in particular, tightness in the foot and toe extensor muscles at the front of the lower leg can create excessive pressure and lead to compression of the deep fibular nerve in their region. Have you experienced any sciatic problems? Please let us know in the comment section down below. Additionally, if you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. So that has been our video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.